Hey, what's up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining the Coastal Campus 6 p.m. experience uh, for the Rock Church. We are so excited to be here. My name is Clay. That's Fink. That's Dylan. And we are here to have a conversation today. Uh, what we want this to be is very interactive. So make sure you're engaging on the chat. Uh, I know our hosts are going to have a great time talking to you and just talking about whatever's going on that we're talking about. So make sure you're active in that. It's going to be a great conversation. We are talking about Luke 7 today. And I'm going to pass the ball over to Fink. We're just going to go ahead and dive right in because it is good. Right to see you guys. In. Luke 7. Um, uh, yeah, we're going to hit this story and uh, just have a conversation about it. I'm excited about it. Uh, you know, if you've been engaging with us either on Sunday nights or Sunday mornings, Thursday nights, you know, we've been in this series called Grace. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, we talked about um, this weekend about this idea of let's say grace. Um, curious. Mm -hmm. Growing up in your homes, because you both grew up in Christian homes, did. Yep. did you call like meal prayers grace? No. Did you say, let's say grace? No. 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 I don't feel like that's a big South Carolina thing, but. What? Really? I, Are you kidding I me? I don't know a single person that has ever called it saying grace. Okay. I I, I, I'm going to ask because we have some people in our studio audience right now. Raise your hand if any of you all said, let's say grace. Okay. Philadelphia. So, Philly girl. Maryland, Maryland girl, sinner. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Noel, you're a legendary human. So I wasn't going to say her name. You just threw it out to the whole world Play that doctor. we were talking about Noel. But Noel is a it's beautiful child of God who is awesome. Noel, at your house, did you all say let's say grace or anything? No. Okay. I see. That's shocking I to me Carolina because thing, I, I have. Know Noel's not from I, Carolina. I, Maybe it is, and I don't know. I, I know had, my circle, I don't know a single person that I grew up with that would actually say, hey, we got to say grace. They would say, let's, let's pray. I had never heard it before I moved down here. I have solved the science problem. Okay. Transplant area, northeast, northeast. The That's people, what I'm saying. The people in South yeah. Carolina who say it are people from northeast. Exactly. I think so. I don't, I don't think there are any true southern people could you please tell us it. if you're from south carolina and you say let's say grace or you grew up saying it um please let me know i think the one i always heard was let's bless the food let's bless, uh, let's bless the food yeah, that's a good point do, do you know that's what the word point. bless actually means i don't want to say yes because i know you're going to drop knowledge on me that i'm not prepared for <laughs> so it means to speak well of like, if you actually take the Hebrew word bless, it means to speak well of. That's the reason when you give somebody a blessing, you're speaking well of them. Lord, this, this, this low country boil, it looks so good. You just spoke well of I it. I just blessed it. This double cheeseburger from McDonald's. Bless My that. favorite is bless it to our bodies. That's, That's right. my favorite one. Yeah. Bless this large pizza from Domino's to our bodies. It's going to come to my body. Oh, I can yeah. tell you that. It's, oh, it's yeah. not as much in my body as around my body. All right, we are way off topic. Like okay, so anyway, we're talking about Let's Say Grace. Um, you know, there's some great uh, movies that talk about saying grace. You know, you got Ricky Bobby, you got uh, Hook, you got uh, Christmas Vacation, stuff like that. Legendary praise. So that's a reason we, we've been, you know, kind of throwing that in every now and then. But to, tonight we want to talk about this idea of let's say grace um, to our enemies. It's the idea of eat with enemies. Now, let me say this again. I've said it all weekend, but let me say it again that I don't really believe as people we should have enemies. We do have people that maybe don't like us or that we don't like, or we have people that we're in conflict with, and we need to invite them to the table. Yep. Um, uh, let, let's think about it this way. Dylan, you were saying it when we were just talking beforehand that it'd be like um, if you're a Republican, it's okay to sit at the table with a Democrat. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> what about this? If you are a... Um, football fan, give me one. It's okay to sit down with a soccer fan. <laughs> oh, I don't know. That, that was, I don't know. That was so good. I don't was, know. Um, awesome. If you're a football fan, you can sit down with a soccer fan. Okay. That was good. Clay, give me another one. Uh, Peyton Manning, Tom Brady fan. I mean, that's just your classic. You know, you have, you know, if you, if you go NBA, you can go with Warriors fans and everybody else. Like, there's just, there's a, there's so a constant. If, if I'm a Pistons fan, um, can I can I eat with a 
Bulls fans. Not if you're Isaiah Thomas and MJ, as we yeah, saw last week. Right. I feel like the ball is in the Bulls fans' court at that point. They might <laughs> Probably not be willing so. to let that one. Uh, I agree. Yeah. But, man, that's some serious conflict going on this week. Serious weekend, conflict, yeah. You know, and he just uh, threw out today that, that um, if uh, – um, LeBron or Durant played back then with them, that they would be the GOATs, not MJ. That's what Isaiah Thomas said. I mean, LeBron 6'8", 265. He's much bigger than MJ was. Yeah, I but he's a big dude. Come on, you young pups. You can't tell me you're not watching that show and you're seeing MJ move and going, okay. I'm an MJ over LeBron guy any day, okay. but I'm saying LeBron is a physical specimen unlike MJ. Yeah, but you watch. You watch. I don't think I'm he would have gotten bullied because I am of the impressed with those highlights. But I'm sure we could do the same exact thing with LeBron's career. Okay. All right. We have officially wasted about six minutes of your life. I, I don't want to say waste, but Is. trying to draw the conclusion of this, that there are times that we need to sit at the table with people that we're in conflict with, um, that um, we have issues with, or maybe they have issues with us. And we're looking at a story this week from Luke 7 uh, that deals with a conflict situation um, that, uh, between Jesus, uh, between a man named Simon, and between a woman who, in the story in Luke 7, we don't see her name. Um, Clay, I know you taught this for our This Gen team this week as well. So yep. just go ahead and tell us the story for a second. Yeah. So, so everybody's up to speed. So Jesus is invited to a guy named Simon's house who's a Pharisee, which is kind of a religious leader at the time. So, you know, if you look throughout the gospel, which is our biographies about Jesus, Jesus and the Pharisees are kind of always in conflict. There's always button heads there. Uh, so he invites them in, and as they're there hanging out, a uh, the the scripture says a certain woman walks in, which I thought that term was interesting. A certain woman that's if you got a label like that, that's not a great label to have on you. Like that's just like oh you're that girl. Mm -hmm. This girl comes in and all of a sudden just goes down to Jesus' feet and and just starts worshiping him. Uh, she's kissing his feet. She's crying. She's weeping. The tears are falling on his feet. She's wiping the tears away with her hair. And as that's happening, Simon thinks to himself, man, if this guy was really a prophet, he would know who's at his feet right now. And at that point, Jesus, 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 and knows what's going on in his head and just kind of calls him out on it. Mm -hmm. And then he goes and he tells a story about forgiveness and, and uh, two guys having debt and uh, one of them had a larger debt than the other. And he asked which one would feel more forgiven, which one would feel more appreciative of the uh, debt being forgiven, and, and Simon was like, well, the larger one, of course. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus goes into the, the example of, hey, you have this woman who is a sinner, but she is thankful and she's loving me unlike you because she's recognizing her sin. She's recognizing that, that she needs me in her life, and you've basically done nothing. Mm -hmm. So Jesus looks at the, the girl and says, your sins are forgiven, and some people around the table are like, who's this guy to even think that he could forgive sins? Yeah. It's a really powerful story of, of conflict where there could have been a lot of conflict between Jesus and this girl. There's conflict between Simon and Jesus, and there's conflict between Simon and the girl. So th there's, a, there's a lot of conflict going on there. A lot of conflict, yeah, yeah. And, and I think if we all admit that we live in a world where there's conflict and, and a lot of it and some people love conflict and some people hate conflict some people will lean into conflict some people will lean away from it i know in in your two personalities that that dylan i know that you've said that you lean into conflict yeah, and i would say that <laughs> and clay you say that you lean away from i it. run away from conflict yeah, yeah. not a fan of it i you know at, I, I agree with you on some parts of that, but I know anytime sports is brought up, you're definitely one to run into conflict on sports. I think we it's may have just seen an example of that. I don't yeah. know, three minutes ago, yeah. but but we'll get more into that in a second um, about the idea of what do we do with the conflict. Um, I want us to to start though with the idea of the grace, um, you know, because if, if you tuned in over uh, on Sunday morning, I talked to this idea about this story gives us a great. A visualization of how to give grace and share truth at the same time. 
And we need to bring people into our lives. We need to sit down at the table with them and eat with them or sit at the, um, the boardroom table if it's at work or whatever it might be and be able to extend grace to those who maybe we're in conflict with or maybe don't like us for some reason. Um, so let's start with that grace idea. And, and with that, it's really inside of the story of Jesus giving grace to this woman um, and also given the, uh, the illustration, the parable about the two men who owed money and uh, both of them were forgiven. So just in that story of the parable per se, let me ask it this way. Why is grace needed? How do we show grace? What, what is the correlation to the grace needed in both of the guys uh, who owed money in the parable. So let's just talk about this idea of being willing to either share grace or the need to share grace. Why should we even do it? So, I think the, the concept of, of needing to share grace all begins at an inward perspective, right? If, if you really look at who we are, we are all sinners in, in some form. We've all made these mistakes. We've all indebted ourselves to God. And uh, just like that, the story, the parable that was said, you had these two guys who were in debt and, and, and their debtor, you know, for, forgave them. And, and that was a powerful moment and it changed their life and they should have been very, very thankful and they were. And then at the same time, we have that with us and God. Like God looks at us and says, look, I know you've sinned. I've known you made these mistakes. I've known you've fallen away from me. You are in debt to me because of the sin. But Jesus died on the cross later, as we see, and, and that, that death on the cross you know, was our payment that we actually needed to have. Like we, mm -hmm. uh, The wages of sin is death. We should have died on that cross. That should have been our punishment, not his. And he took that sin upon his shoulders, which means that we are people who have been given grace. And that's exactly why we need to share that grace as well. If, mm -hmm. we're, if we're able to give, get something that great by God, then there's no reason we shouldn't share that with other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I think Jesus tends to speak in parables as a way to explain what's really going on. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, kind of what Clay alluded to, like, the issue of sin is brought up, and the parable Jesus dives into immediately talks about debt. Um, because similar to debt, sin amounts a cost that is hard to pay back, right? Sure, like, yeah. I mean, this is, like, people in our country all over the world are just in debt. And that's a weight. I think you feel that every single day. It can be hard to get out of that once you get in, right? Mm -hmm. Some people would say it can be impossible to get out of, like, right? Mm -hmm. Student loans. You have them. Stu I have them. Student loans are a real problem. Doesn't it feel like that's impossible to overcome? It's a lot of money. Right. And in a similar way, sin is a debt that is impossible to, over to overcome, right? It's mm -hmm. impossible for us to pay that debt back. Um, and Jesus uses a similar parable um, in the book of Mark, where he talks about a master who is owed money by two of his servants and or by one of his servants, and that servant is forgiven. But um, Jesus, this parable takes it a step further because that that servant who's forgiven of his debt then goes to somebody who owes him a, an insignificant amount of money and starts basically bullying him for his money. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is the perfect example of how we don't show grace, right? Right. Um, when Jesus gives us grace and absolves that debt of sin, I think that should make us all the more fast to give out grace to mm -hmm. people, even when we feel like they don't deserve it because we didn't deserve the debt being paid, right? Yeah. So if we are given much, we should give much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that, that that story you just brought up, that parable that you just brought up is a great example of what's happening here in the story. You have Simon, who who should be for, forgiven by Jesus. You know, there's an opportunity for him to be forgiven by Jesus as someone who's made mistakes, as someone who's fallen away, as someone who, you know, was human. And mm -hmm. when you're human, you're going to sin at times. And he's in that position. Yet he looks at the woman and says, does he not realize there's a sinner at his feet? Mm -hmm. The certain woman, the, the, the sinner is weeping at his feet. Why is he even let her close to him? And it's that kind of mentality that, that shows that grace was available for Simon. He could, you know, he could reach into that and he could give that as well, right? He could receive it and he could give it. But giving grace is pretty impossible to give when you don't realize you are also in need of grace. That's right. And and that was just he just didn't realize that he needed 
grace. Mm -hmm. And because he didn't realize he himself needed grace, he thought he was better than the other person, uh, than the woman, and then wouldn't give that grace to her. Mm -hmm. And and unfortunately, I think that's a, a lot of people in our culture we struggle with is that we don't think that we are the problem. We don't think we have problems. Deep down in our heart, we know we do. Right. But we ignore them. We, we kind of say, oh, you know what? That's I'm not uh, as bad as that person. I'm not as bad well, as that Well, yeah, person. that's what Simon the Pharisee did, right? This yeah. pious religious leader says, yeah. well, doesn't Jesus know the woman that that is, like, wiping his feet right now? Doesn't he know that she's a sinner? Yeah. I mean, Jesus, I think, had more to say about the sin of the Pharisees than he did the sin of the people all throughout the Gospels. Yeah. He called yeah. them whitewashed tombs. Mm -hmm. Hey, you're pretty on the outside. You're dead on the inside. Mm -hmm. But that's what we do, right? Like, you're spot on. Like, we look at other people's sin and say, well, at least I'm not as bad as them. Mm -hmm. Right? Not understanding that grace is, an, grace is an equal payment for a debt that we can't pay back, right? That's the key. I think that's the key is it doesn't matter. Sin is sin, and when you sin, then we all have an equal payment that we can't make. Right, because right. even when you said the student loans, it seems like an insurmountable debt, okay, that you're trying to just, you're just trying to claw it. You do know, over time, consistent payments, you will get out of that debt. Yeah, yeah. But with sin... There's nothing you can do to get out of that nothing. debt. Nothing, nothing. So it doesn't matter... Now, we know the consequences of sin on earth can be at different levels, right? But the spiritual consequences They're is one and the same, and it's a debt that we cannot get over. So I think that's really, you know, what, what Jesus is trying to, to land here is to help these guys or to help Simon go realize, recognize you're a sinner as well. You know, not that she's not a sinner. You're a sinner yeah. as well, yeah. you know. Um, and I think when we start to recognize our sin, that's when all of a sudden grace becomes more real. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, and, and I know that in my life, and I'm sure you guys could speak to the same in your life. You could remember, you know, whether it was the day that you truly it was like, Jesus, I need to surrender to you. Um, whether it was, you know, a sin you, you did and you're just like, I need Jesus so bad, you know. It's, it's what we all got to recognize. So uh, let me flip the, the coin just a little bit to the second part of the story. Um, and, you know, so we see this grace interacting, and we see this parable that he's told. And, and then he, once he's done with the parable, he, he speaks to the woman. Excuse me. He, he looks at the woman but speaks to Simon and then talks about she's giving love because she's been forgiven of a lot and you're not. He starts to just speak some serious truth to Absolutely. Him. He brings up, hey, we're in conflict. Let's deal with this right now. So let, let's talk about that because when we go to a table, when we're sitting at a table with people who maybe don't like us, we have to extend grace because even though maybe they've hurt you, we're all still sinners and we've got to walk mm -hmm. out grace. It doesn't mean in the absence of truth, though. Right. You know what I mean? You have and, and I think that's where so many times that's what happens is you, you recognize conflict and it's, Clay, you mentioned, I want to run from it. You know what I mean? Uh, yes, absolutely. So when you and Katie are in conflict, oh, I don't know if I should go here. Um, <laughs> that doesn't happen, right, Clay? You no, know, we've, we've never gotten into a fight ever. We're a perfect couple. How quick are you to say I'm sorry? Oh, to the point where she says, if you keep saying I'm sorry, I'm going to be actually mad at you. There you Yeah. Because you're just trying to, like, I just got to get past that. I just got to get, get past, past it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and Dylan, you, you confess that it's like, no, I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, your wife is in the room. She's I can pull right her up and we give her camera, a microphone so and go, all right, let's, let's talk about she's this. She's fact checking everything I say from this point <laughs> forward. But. There is great value in speaking truth into the midst of conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and we see Jesus just speaking truth into Simon's life right now. So, Dylan, I'm just going to ask you just about this part of the story. Like, what do you, what do you see there? And, and, and when it comes to, to speaking truth in conflict, go ahead and just share with us a little bit. Well, I think the biggest thing is that a lot of people fear conflict, and I think don't think conflict is something to be feared, right? Like, and this is all kind of based around um, the scripture that says, as iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another, right? 
how how does that process happen? Mm-hmm. If we think about it, like scientifically, iron sharpens iron through friction, right? Mm-hmm. It's not it's not until the two things rub against the grain, right? Like I've got a knife sharpener at home that I use for cooking. It's not until I go against the grain of the knife that the knife becomes more useful. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. And I think that is really what scripture is getting to. Like, w- unless we have this friction, unless these sparks fly at times, we're not going to, we're not going to grow. Right. Unless I have somebody to come alongside me and challenge me and be like, Hey, I love you, but you're wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm, I don't know. I'm wrong. If we surround ourselves in an echo chamber of yes, men and people pleasers and people that are afraid of conflict and run from it, we are not going to grow more like to be more like Jesus, right? Mm -hmm, Like mm -hmm. scripture uses the analogy of vines and branches, but it says that vines are pruned Mm -hmm. so that they can grow. Mm -hmm. If you don't have someone to cut the dead things out of your life, how are, how are the good things ever going to thrive? So I think conflict is is something to be embraced when it's handled well, which I think we get a picture of by looking at how Jesus handles it, especially in this story. Sure. Sure. And well, let's just keep going there. How do we see Jesus handling the conflict from either one of you? Well, and the, it was beneficial for me to, to really understand and view this story from that side because I I struggle with conflict, and I know there's a lot of people watching that, that do as well, and I know there's a lot of people that are, are more in Dylan's world. But what I what I learned from the story is it's Jesus was just being very real about what was happening at that moment. Like, there wasn't a lot of hiding. There wasn't a lot of uh, faking his way through it. It was like, hey, this is what's really happening. He, he recognized he was very real that there was a problem that occurred, that there was a sin, there was an issue that occurred. And there's a lot of us that that we feel like, ah, man, like, uh, I don't really know if there's a problem here, but I know there is deep down. And then what ends up happening is we don't address it in the person. And then we go and we're talking to another friend or talk to our spouse or talking to our coworker and we share the problems there. And then all of a sudden we're talking behind someone's back about the problem that occurs. That person doesn't even really recognize that there's a problem, but there's a, there's a problem going on behind the scenes. And then Jesus was very real about what had happened. And I love that he kind of just spoke very clearly like, hey, she did this, you did not. She did that, you did not. She did this, you did not. And we just kind of went down a line and said, like, this is what occurred. And I thought that was important because when you're dealing with the issue of conflict, you have to be very real and acknowledge what happened because what will happen is if you don't do that, your feelings will get in the way of facts. Mm -hmm. And your feelings and your emotions and all these things that are stirring up you or your anger, your sadness, your frustration, your confusion will twist reality. I I can't tell you, you're someone who did student ministry for 20 years. How many times are you in contact with two students who are angry at each other and you hear both sides of the story and both of them are completely wrong about what had actually happened? Mm -hmm. There are elements that are right and you work it towards the middle of what actually happened. But what happened What happened to them was their feelings got in the way and it made what happened into a different world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the, fa- the bringing up the facts addresses what actually happened, which mm-hmm. I, I think is important because I think we handle conflict with a little bit too much emotion sometimes. Absolutely. It's, it's, it, and that's to what you said. Yeah. It's something to make us better, not, not an emotional type. Right. Thing. It's not a conflict... And I think the problem is that sometimes people have come to us in conflict and handled it wrong. And rather than pointing out the problem in our life, they make us the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not, well, you've got this issue in your life. It's you are the issue in your life. Mm -hmm. That's wrong, too. That's abusive, manipulative behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's not a biblical precedent of conflict, right, right? Right, right, Jesus doesn't go to Simon the Pharisee and say, well, you know, you're just a horrible person and you're a sinner. And he points out, hey, you didn't do this. Like, you haven't been welcoming. You have not been loving to me. She is, so why are you mad at her? Mm-hmm. You can... You can set a good biblical precedent for conflict, not by jumping to to put down and belittle other people, but simply to call out the sin areas and the blind spots in their life. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that is the, the critical side of this, that if we're thinking about it from a practical standpoint, of how does this play out in my life? Because I, I do have to sit at the, the kitchen table with people that I live with, and maybe there's some relational tension. Uh, I, I do have to sit at the boardroom table with people I work with, and maybe there's some relational tension. I, I have to sit at the the uh, athletic table, you know, with some guys on the team, and there's some tension. And if I allow my feelings to get in the way, 
I'll never deal with the relational side, um, which means I'll never have peace. But if I'm willing to speak truth in the situations, not at the person, right. but, but with the person, with the whole goal of bringing grace into the situation. Because even at the end of the story, that, that when, when Jesus said that to Simon, he, he brought up the facts. He brought them up in a timely manner. But he also, at the very end of the story, brought up grace again. That's the kicker is I think. You have to do that. Yeah. So Carly and I talked at uh, BCM, which is a college ministry a while back, about conflict in relationships. And there were really three things that we wanted people to know. And that's one, embrace conflict. So don't be afraid of it. See it as a tool, what we've already kind of talked about. Two, manage conflict, right? Follow the biblical uh, kind of guidelines for it. You know, don't be angry in your anger. Do not sin, right? right. Things like that. Um, but then the third one, and probably the most important one, was resolve conflict, right? Mm -hmm. Scripture, all throughout Scripture, you know, if you remember that your brother has something against you, go to them and reconcile that, right? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Um, don't let the, the devil divide you, right? Okay. Don't let him get a foothold. All throughout Scripture, we see the, the mandate not only to embrace conflict, but to resolve it. And I think mm -hmm. that's what Jesus did here. Mm -hmm. And that should be the end goal of conflict, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try to resolve it and do your part, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And they might not reciprocate, but I'm always going to do my part because I want to bring grace to the table. And um, I love the end of the story. He says, go in peace to the lady. Like, you're not in conflict with me. Go in peace. You have grace go in peace. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to bring into Simon's life as well. You know, because we haven't said this uh, yet tonight, but bottom line is Jesus wants to give grace to Simon just as much as he wants to give grace to the sinful one. Yes. You know, um, so, so that's the goal. But to do that, you got to speak truth into the situation, you know. So, um, well, we've got to wrap up. Uh, I know it's, um, I, I love getting together like this. Um, I think there's a lot of good things that we can learn from this story about how to give grace and how to speak truth. Um, and, and I pray that we will all do that, that we'll invite people to the table who um, maybe we know um, have issues with us or we have issues with them because what we want to see is things to be resolved and grace to be had by everyone. Um, so I want grace for us. I want grace for everybody who's living, uh, or excuse me, watching this. I want grace for everybody who's living in the world. And, and for that to happen, we have to be willing to sit down at the table with anyone um, for that to, that to happen. So, so hey, we're going to wrap up. Dylan, I'm going to let you send us out, you know, tell, uh, you know, just, I know we've got people watching, uh, maybe new people, whatever. Just I'll let you kind of wrap us up. Well. This was fun. It's a good time, right? Hey, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying doing this. I hope that you are too. Uh, if you ever have any questions that you want to drop in the chat, go ahead and maybe we can get to those some other week or something like that if time allows. Um, if you are new to The Rock, maybe you're checking out services for the first time this weekend. Um, you've probably heard already throughout some of our other services, but we do have a number that you can text, which is 843-444-2144. Is that right? Boom. Bro, I got Nailed it memorized it. at this point. Look at that. Nailed text it. the word connect to that so that we can just get to know you a little better. You can fill out a digital connect card that way. That's just probably the best way for us to come alongside you and help you take some next steps and maybe even figure out what those are. But, man, this was fun. It's good stuff. It was awesome. So hopefully we see you all back next week. Sounds good. See you guys.